So we're back. And so if you recall, we uh, were discussing this subject, which is how is it that you get non-thermal particles? Non-thermal particles meaning this is the number of particles as a function of energy and this is clearly not a Maxwellian. This is a power law, right? And these are what are called non-thermal particles. This is what we were discussing. So what we said was that, that these non-thermal particles are produced as a result of collisions in a phenomenological acceleration region, okay? And the requirement is that in each collision, there is an energy gain and this beta is larger than one. Uh, maybe I should write it here. Beta is larger than one. So this would be the energy gain after k collisions. However, it's not as if the particle, the given particle which is getting accelerated can just get accelerated indefinitely. It's not like that. What's uh, in fact happening is that um, after each collision, there is a certain probability P, which is less than one, that the particle can actually escape the acceleration region. Okay, so the particle can escape the acceleration region with a probability P less than one. And so after K collisions, what happens is the energy of the particle is beta raised to K. And after K collisions, the number of particles remaining in the acceleration region is given by this and, and taken together, it results in this kind of a power law uh, distribution of particles, which is clearly non-thermal and which is what we are talking about, right? Now, one important thing to remember is that you require that E is equal to beta E naught beta greater than one in each collision. In other words, you require an energy gain in each collision. Okay. So whatever the collisions with these scattering centers are, you want to ensure that there's an energy gain in each collision so that with each successive collision, the energy of the particle keeps increasing. Now let's think a little bit about what kind of situation would ensure that there's an energy gain in each collision. Okay, so now let us think of a particle and a scattering center. I have so this would be the particle which is destined to gain energy and this would be a scattering center. In fact, in the original, in the original formulation by Fermi, I believe it was in 1950 if I'm not mistaken, but in the original formulation by Fermi, Fermi simply, Enrico Fermi, the famous Italian astrophysicist, he, uh, thought of uh, the particles as, as some phenomenological particles and the scattering centers as large immobile clouds, okay? So, which is why I've drawn it this way. Here's a particle and here's a scattering center and, and the particle is essentially a test particle. What do I mean by that? It's a test particle in the sense that whatever happens to this particle hardly affects the scattering center. The scattering center is some sort of a large cloud. It's a huge rock, for instance, and uh, it's hardly affected by what happens. Think of the particle as a light uh, table tennis or a ping pong ball, and think of the, the scattering center as a large uh, table tennis racket, okay? So you know when you hit a little table tennis ball with a table tennis racket, the, there's hardly any recoil on the racket. Whereas the light ball, it goes uh, bouncing off, right? So this is what happens, right? So that's exactly the kind of situation we are en uh, envisaging. So this would be a large, a large scattering center. Okay. Okay. But even so, I think this is 1950. I would urge you to, you know, check this, this treatment of, of uh, you know, scattering. Okay, so now 
consider a, an approaching collision. Consider a situation where either the particle or the scattering center or both are approaching each other like this. Okay? So consider a situation where the particle and the scattering center are approaching each other. So consider an approaching collision. Right? And in such a situation, in such an approaching collision kind of situation, where this guy is moving this way and the scattering center is also moving this way. Okay, or you can transform frames such that and maybe one is stationary and the other one. Either way, you understand what an approaching collision is. An approaching collision would be one where there is definite, the particle definitely gains energy. Okay, and I would also say an approaching inelastic collision inelastic, right? The collision is inelastic, that's why there's an energy gain. So in an approaching collision, the particle definitely gains energy, this fellow. This, this, this particle definitely gains energy. Whereas in an overtaking collision, in an overtaking collision, one where the particle is here and the scattering center is here, the particle is moving in this direction and the scattering center is also moving in this direction and the particle is trying to overtake the scattering center, right? The particle loses energy. Right? So in this case, the E equals, you know, if you write down the energy of the particle as this, E equals beta raised to K, or uh, in, in a single collision, E is equal to beta times E naught. The beta would be larger than one in an approaching collision, right? And in an overtaking collision, the beta would be less than one. Okay, so this is clear. And clearly, in our treatment here, we have assumed we want, we want beta to be larger than one. In other words, you know, we want approaching collisions. Okay, so we essentially, since we need, we need in E equals beta times E naught for each collision, okay, for beta larger than one, we need approaching collisions. Okay, so this is the situation that we're talking about. We would like a situation where the scattering center is always approaching the particle, okay, and the particle always gains energy with each collision. And of course, it's not as if the, the particle will keep encountering more and more and more scattering centers as time goes by. Otherwise, you know, the particle would just simply, you know, amass infinite amounts of energy and that would, you know, that would create problems. So we say that, yeah, the, the particle gains energy with each uh, successive collision, approaching collisions uh, to be precise. And, uh, you know, as time goes on, uh, the particle has a finite probability of leaving the scattering center. Uh, leaving this region filled with scattering centers and therefore the number of accelerated particles goes down. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, situation we're talking about. Now, what does this have to do with shocks, you might ask? Because, you know, that, that's the whole point. We are, after all, talking about shocks as agents of particle acceleration. So what does this have to do with shocks? So let us now consider a shock like this. Yeah, so this would be the shock. And now we're not talking about particles anymore. We are talking about the fluid, the low energy, the, the background fluid, which forms a shock. Okay, so this is the shock. And this is the frame of the lab frame. This is as observed in the lab frame. As observed lab frame, the shock is moving ahead with a velocity u. 
okay and there's a downstream region characterized by some you know uh, as, as some density rho 1 some temperature t1 and some pressure p1 and there's an upstream region sorry yeah so this would be the downstream region and this would be the upstream region and and this is characterized by some density rho 2 t2 and p2 right and we know that the whole point of a shock is that there's a very definite relationship there's a very definite jump right here at the shock for the time being we just idealize the shock as an infinitely thin discontinuity okay and there's a very definite relationship between rho 1 and rho 2 t1 and t2 p1 and p2 we know this and so let's consider a shock yeah which is moving like so and you've got scattering centers embedded in both these so you've got scattering centers here and you've got scattering centers here as well the scattering centers are not part of the fluid are not part of the background either of the background fluid neither the scattering centers nor the energetic particles are part of the background fluid okay but the scattering centers are you know are carried along by the fluid okay the scattering centers are frozen into the fluid if the fluid is moving the scattering centers also move with the fluid okay so you've got scattering centers both in the downstream region as well as the upstream region and they are simply moving along with the fluid the scattering centers are not part of the background fluid maybe think of the background fluid as something blue the scattering centers as something black and maybe the particles which are destined to get accelerated as red okay and the scattering centers are also few and far between and so are the accelerated particles particles which are destined to get accelerated they are also few and far between whereas a background fluid there are so many background you know low energy particles that they are they you you just observe them as a blue continuum okay so here you have you have a shock moving like so and this is how this picture looks like in the lab frame now let us consider how it would look like in the shock frame in other words you climb onto the shock in the frame of the shock in other words here is an observer who is sitting on the shock right so as far as this observer is concerned the shock is stationary yeah so in the shock frame the shock is stationary obviously yeah so you've got a shock which is stationary yeah and because because the shock is stationary it does not have a velocity u but for the observer sitting on the shock he or she will find that the fluid in here is rushing towards the shock with a velocity u so therefore the v1 the v1 here is equal to like that moving this way okay and we know that there's a very definite relationship between the velocity here and the velocity here yeah and let us consider an infinitely strong shock for which the rankine hegonian conditions are satisfied right the rankine hegonian conditions for an infinitely strong shock are satisfied so we know that there's a factor of four difference between the velocity here and the velocity here right so here what happens is you have the fluid is is moving this is all in the shock frame the fluid is moving with a velocity v2 which is equal to one fourth of v1 right and this is assuming an infinitely strong shock but the point is you have v1 which is u and v2 which is one fourth of u1 this is in the shock frame okay where are we going with all this you will see in a minute okay all right so let us now go into the frame of the downstream frame okay in the downstream frame however 
In other words, let us go back here in this frame. So we now want to climb into the frame where the fluid on the downstream side is at rest. Okay, so how do I do that? I go from the shock frame, I subtract a velocity v1, okay, and that brings me into the frame where, you know, this stuff is at rest, right? So I subtract the velocity v1, and so you've got the shock here, and here, you know, the velocity is zero, because I'm at rest, but here you see, I've got fluid rushing, okay, towards me with three quarters u. Why is that? You can see that from here. So you see, you've got v1 coming to the left, right? And so what I want to make, I want to make this zero, right? So I add a velocity u, rightward velocity u here, that makes it zero. And if I add a rightward velocity here, equal to u, okay? So I have u minus one fourth of v1, which is u, and that gives me a three fourths u coming towards the right. Now, what do I have here? I've got lots of scattering centers. I've got scattering centers, which I'm going to denote by these squiggly lines, okay? So consider accelerated particles, which are advected along with the, so th these would be particles which are destined to get accelerated, okay? They are being swept from the left to the right, and the reason, and here is the reason for calling this diffusive shock acceleration. What happens is, in the vicinity of the shock, there are enough scattering centers so that these particles can diffuse over from this side to this side. Once they diffuse over to this side, okay, so, or for that matter, they can diffuse over from this side to this side, okay. So, once they diffuse over to this side, okay, the particles are sitting here, okay, and they have equilibrated with the fluid here, okay, so they are at rest, but you see there are scattering centers embedded with the fluid on both sides, okay. So, they are at rest essentially, and what they observe is that there are scattering centers from the left approaching them with a velocity three quarters u. So, they are approaching the particles that are destined to be accelerated. So, you've got approaching collisions. You've got so you've got particles that used to be here, which diffusively crossed over to this side, and once they've crossed over to this side, they equilibrate and they become part of the downstream fluid. Okay, and they're just sitting there happily, just waiting around. What they see is that they are approached by scattering centers, which are approaching them at a speed three quarters u. And they experience approaching collisions and we know what happens during approaching collisions, the beta is larger than one and the particles gain energy. Okay, so this is very important. So they gain energy when they are embedded in the downstream fluid. So they gain energy as a result of these approaching collisions. Okay. Fine, so they gained energy. They, they got one hit from these paddles which, were, which are approaching them. So fine, okay. Now what happens is let us now consider, let us now draw this shock again, except now we want to draw this in the upstream frame. Okay, this was in the downstream frame. Okay, now I want to remain in the upstream frame. In other words, I want to make this velocity zero. I want to make this velocity zero so that I can be at rest in this frame. That's what upstream frame means, right? How do I do that? Well, I add a leftward directed velocity equal to three quarters u. If I do that, this becomes zero. But of course, this out here, I have to do the same on both sides, right? So out here, I get a three quarters u moving to the left, right? And that's what happens here. So here, I've got rest frame. That's what I mean by the squiggly lines. The fluid is not moving, but on the other hand, here, I've got fluid moving at three quarters 
you. Okay. Maybe I should have a, a mod sign here too. So here I've got fluid as far as the upstream frame goes. If I was in the upstream frame, I would see the fluid rushing towards me with a velocity three quarters u. Okay, now what happened to these accelerated particles here? It gained energy, yeah? It gains energy, so that's fine. But after it gained energy due to the approaching collisions from scattering centers on the, you know, uh, from the up, upstream side, it was on the downstream side and scattering centers from the upstream side approach them, yeah, and they, they hit them, bam, and they gain energy. Now after that what happens is they diffusively cross over to, the ups, uh, to this side. And that's the whole point. Diffusion is a very important, the ability to diffuse on both sides of the shock is a very important aspect to this problem. If you do not have diffusion, uh, this whole process will not work. Okay, so they diffusively cross over to this side. And now they are like this, yeah, they've diffusively crossed over to the upstream side and they equilibrate with the upstream frame. In other words, in the upstream frame, they are at rest. So the particles are here. They're happily sitting in the upstream frame. They've already gained energy due to one collision and they are still, they're happily at rest. Now, what do they observe? Well, as we said, there are scattering centers on both sides, right? So even on this side, there are scattering centers and these guys which have already gained energy due to one collision, right? They observe scattering centers again moving towards them at a velocity three quarters u. And remember, this was also three quarters u and this is also three quarters u, okay? They observe since they have equilibrated here, you know, they now observe scattering centers moving towards them at a velocity three quarters u. And again, you've got approaching collisions. Approaching collision again. Okay, they diffuse to the upstream side and they again experience, you know, an approaching collision. So they gain energy again. So what's really happening here is that particles are repeatedly diffuse back and forth across the shock, right? In other words, from the upstream side to the downstream side and vice versa. They keep diffusing back and forth, okay? And in each and after each shock crossing, after each crossing, they experience an approaching collision. That's the whole point, right? They experience an approaching collision after each shock crossing, i.e. repeated energy gains, right? So they repeatedly experience energy gains. So they diffuse back and forth across the shock and after each crossing, they experience an approaching collision. From who? From the scattering centers that are embedded along with the flow. Okay, so therefore you experience this kind of a situation with a beta greater than one because on each side of the shock you have an approaching collision, so a beta is greater than one. And since they are repeatedly doing this, after k collisions, so after k collisions, i.e. after k diffusive shock crossings, the energy of a given particle is beta raised to k e raised to zero, as we wanted. 
So here's a physical situation where, where this condition is satisfied. And of course, since the, the, the whole thing is diffusive, it's not as if particles can, you know, sometimes, you know, they, they, they diffuse back and forth, but they don't, they really do not have to remain in the vicinity of the shock always. They can diffuse a little farther away. Once they diffuse a little farther away, they'll find it difficult to come all the way close to the shock. And therefore, there is also escape, I should say. The diffusive nature also ensures escape with a probability p less than 1. In other words, after k crossings, the number of particles is equal to n naught p raised to k, where p is less than 1. And remember, these were the two ingredients that we needed. We needed this and we needed this, right? And you eliminate k between this and this, and you get a power law distribution in the number of uh, n of e. These two result in an n of e which goes as E raised to minus alpha. In other words, a non-thermal particle distribution. Okay. So, this is, a, is an explicit demonstration of the phenomenon of diffusive and diffusive is very important shock acceleration. Diffusive shock acceleration of who? Of the test particles. Okay. By who? By the particles are accelerated by who? Well, they are accelerated via uh, encounters, head on encounters with scattering centers which are embedded along with the fluid which flows with the shock. Okay. So, the scattering centers are embedded in the fluid and therefore they just simply obey whatever the fluid tells them to. If the fluid is flowing and it, if the flow has a certain discontinuity, well, they also flow with the same velocity. Okay? So, it's important to clearly understand these uh, frame transformations. This would be the lab frame and this would be the shock frame and this would be the downstream frame and this would be the upstream frame. Really, in order to understand the fact that there are approaching collisions, all you need really is a downstream frame and the upstream frame. But in order to get to the downstream frame, the upstream frame, you need to go via the shock frame. So, I urge you to turn this over in your head a little bit to understand how exactly the shock acceleration happens. And uh, this treatment is taken from uh, Longer's book, High Energy Astrophysics. I believe this is uh, by Cambridge University Press. So, I urge you to look up this book for the details. And so, uh, this particular treatment is taken from there. And so, what we have now done is we have, we have, we have shown, not shown, we have justified to some extent, we have uh, the role of fluid shocks as particle accelerators. And I thought it was important to demonstrate this even though, even though particle acceleration as such is not really part of a fluid dynamics course, but in astrophysical fluid dynamics, shocks are simply agents for accelerating particles. So, I thought it was important to sort of give you at least a brief flavor of how particle acceleration takes place before going on and examining how, um, you know, how shocks arise in astrophysical contexts and so on and so forth. So, when we meet next, uh, we will consider the formation of shocks in supernovae, supernovae shocks.
are a, a very well studied uh, phenomenon in astrophysics and the predictions of the theory match the observations very well indeed. So, when we meet next we will consider spherically symmetric shocks in supernovae and I also wanted to re-emphasize that shocks are to be found in all kinds of other astrophysical situations such as near earth shocks, the earth's bow shock, you know shocks in accretion flows, shocks in supernovae and so on and so forth. We will simply consider one of these situations uh, that of spherically symmetric shocks in supernovae. So, that is it for now and thank you.